The impacts of austerity um, have had quite drastic effects on homelessness. Um, since 2010, when um, austerity policies were rolled out, uh, we've seen a number of welfare reforms, um, such as the benefit caps, the bedroom tax, the localism act, uh, which affected housing policies essentially. If we think about austerity more widely and its impact on homelessness services, what we see is that between 2010 and 2017, which is the latest year for which figures are available at the moment, there's a 23% reduction in the number of accommodation services available to people experiencing homelessness and a 21% loss in the number of bed spaces. It's a long time ago, it's about 20 years since I was working in um, Soho in community mental health and we had um, clients who were, were homeless and it was really challenging because they were in hospital a lot of the time um, because there was nowhere else for them to go. They didn't need to be in an inpatient mental health unit. They did initially when they were first referred, mm. um, first admitted, but then there was, there was nowhere. And so it also creates all sorts of challenges because no one wants to be in an inpatient mental health unit longer than they have to be. Um, and But there was nowhere else for them to be referred to. Mm. Um, and this is a common issue that, you know, they're going to be, um, there's going to be a shortage of accommodation in the community uh, and we need to invest sufficiently to, to make sure that there are the supports available when, when they're needed. I went to the council and I said to them, I said, look, I've got a job. I need to find a place to stay. Can you help me with that? And they're like, you have to find it yourself. We'll pay your first month's rent and deposit but then there's so many landlords in Milton Keynes that don't accept DSS, even though it was only for the first month that I had my work contract and everything. Up to 40% of landlords, it's estimated, won't accept either housing benefit or universal credit. And so that means that the properties available to people in receipt of one of these benefits reduces drastically. So people are often forced to choose between accommodation that might not be suitable or might be of poorer quality than other people might have access to because the market available is so reduced. Uh, we've seen a number of welfare reforms like those that made it very difficult for people to maintain their housing and it made it very difficult for people to um, afford their rent. So if we take universal credit, there are different aspects of this that have probably impacted on homelessness. So one might be that there's a six week wait for payment when you're entitled to universal credit. And although you can ask for an advance on that payment, you will still have to pay that back. So there's a six week period where even if you're in receipt of money, over the long term that will be deducted from the amount of benefit that you get. And that's a big change from job seekers allowance. And when, and when your home's trying to get welfare benefits, you can't get it because you need an address to um, send your benefits and you, and you need a bank account and everything else. A number of vulnerable and low income families do live in the private rented sector. And the private rented sector is uncontrolled, it's deregulated. So that means that a landlord can charge £60 per week for rent or £1,000 per week for rent. And there's no control on rents in the private rented sector. And the landlords do kind of know that actually people are fearful of losing their home. Uh, there's certainly some issues with people not wanting to rock the boat with their landlords because they worry that people are, you know, that they're going to be made homeless. Um, even though, you know, there's technically laws in place to prevent that, it can, um, it can be got around in other ways. We can also see the impact of the local housing allowance, which is now a part of either new housing benefit claims or universal credit claims. And in this case, local housing allowance is worked out on the average local rents, but people are only entitled to the 30th percentile of the average rent of the area. So what that means is that 70% of private rents in that area will be higher than what that person is entitled to, and only 30% of those rents will be lower. So that means that in lots of cases, people won't be able to afford accommodation that might be suitable for them, or they might have to top it up out of their benefit. A number of housing policies that came into effect during the 1980s and 
This was around the time actually we started to see homelessness not as an individual problem per se, but as a problem related directly related to housing and poverty. One really important housing policy that came into effect in the 1980s was uh, the Housing Act, which introduced the Right to Buy Act. And the Right to Buy Act allowed uh, tenants to um, buy their own home with a 75% discount of the market rate. So it allowed people essentially to buy their council home that they were currently occupying at a very affordable rate. It is essentially 25% of the, of the full cost. And uh, so what we saw happen uh, there is we saw approximately 2 million um, house, house, council houses sold off under the right to buy. And those houses weren't replaced. That money as well that was raised in revenue through selling off council stock didn't go back to, didn't go back to the local authorities to, to invest in the communities. It went straight to central government. Um, so we didn't see a reinvestment um, through the sell-off of those council homes. And essentially we ended up with what's called um, a, a residual stock and the homes that weren't sold off were the poor quality homes. And so we saw a polarisation of um, home ownership and uh, a renting of poor uh, council housing stock. Um, and that occurred basically in the early 1980s. Another aspect of welfare reform is uh, when people in private sector rentals, rather than the payment of their housing benefit or the housing element of their universal credit going direct to their landlord, as would have been the case previously, they might be asked to manage that payment themselves. So they'll be paid it, and they'll be asked to then pay it to their landlords. And that can cause complications for people. If someone has been housed and they get a direct payment rather than it going to a landlord, there are people who have real concerns about that and I think that to do a kind of one size fits all thing, you know, if someone's an addict and they're saying to you, I actually, I'm not going to be able to manage this money if you hand it all to me. I think actually that's, you know, that's really good forward planning from them. Traditionally, the social housing um, sector has always been the more affordable, genuinely affordable um, form of housing. But since uh, the Localism Act came into effect in 2011, uh, the government reduced subsidies, subsidy funding to social housing associations, and it reduced its funding from approximately 8 billion to 4 billion to social housing organisations. And in order to compensate for that loss, social housing organisations were allowed to in, uh, introduce what's called affordable rents. And affordable rents are more expensive than social rents. Social rents tend to be at 50% of the market rate, whereas affordable rents are at 80% of the market rate. So what's happened since 2011 in social housing uh, forms of accommodation, we've seen a rise in rents there too. And we've seen a rise in the private rented sector too. So um, since the welfare reforms come into effect, we've seen rents in the private rent sector and social housing increase. As the rents are increasing in the housing sector, uh, with the introduction of benefit caps, um, people haven't been able to cover the full rent or the full rental costs. So what's happened is, is that since 2011 and certainly since 2013, people have, um, have been uh, forced to make up the shortfall in rent because with benefit caps it now only covers so much of people's full weekly income which includes housing rental costs and so we've seen a massive fallout of that we've seen a rise in numbers of homelessness because of those policies in a deregulated housing market uh, we've seen at the peak we've seen um, soaring rates of eviction we've seen unprecedented levels of eviction occurring in the rented sector both social housing and private rented sector at the peak we've seen about 115 evictions take place per day um, and as a result, those people who are being evicted, they have to present to their local authority as, you know, for homeless status, for a home, as a homeless applicant, um, in order to qualify for emergency housing. Also, what happened under the Localism Act is that 
um, homeless families would normally be housed in social housing and social rented housing because it was a, a form of um, cheap and a form of quality housing. So it was a way, so it was a source of housing for vulnerable homeless families. But since 2011, and for the first time in the history of our welfare state, um, local authorities are able to discharge discharge their duty and offload homeless families into the private rented sector to house them in the private rented sector. And that's also creating problems for homeless families. As I've said, um, the rents in the private rented sector are extremely high, it's extremely precarious, there's no security of tenure there. So what's happened since the rollout of austerity policies is we've seen very vulnerable homeless families being housed in very volatile and expensive housing market. And even those families that are in traditionally, traditionally cheaper rented housing, they're finding it very difficult to pay for rents in, 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 in social housing. Get more from The Open University. Check out the links on screen now.